Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth. I'm your host Amy Walker and I'm going to be joined by a special guest each week to discuss some amazing stories from across history. For this first episode, I'm being joined by Addie Ann Hang. Hello. Okay, so Addie, you, just so the listeners know, they're kind of in the same boat as you. You know absolutely nothing about what we're going to be talking about, do you? Not at all. Fun? Nervous? <laughs> uh, Excited. I like learning about history. Good. Excited is what I'm, I'm trying to go for here. Hopefully by the end you'll say you'll have found it exciting. I guess time will tell. Okay, so are you, are you ready to start the story? Yes. Okay. Peter Curtin was born in a poverty-stricken, abusive family in Mulheim am Rhein, Germany, on the 26th of May, 1883. He was the third of 13 children. Curtin's parents were both alcoholics who lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and although Curtin's father was an efficient workman who earned sufficient money to provide food, shelter and clothing for his family, the relationship between the parents was marred by domestic violence Curtin's father would inflict upon both his wife and children, particularly when he was drunk. When intoxicated, Curtin's father would often force his wife and children to assemble in one room before ordering his wife to strip naked and engage with intercourse with him as his children watched. That's the wrong kind of kink. (laughs) Yes, um, it gets worse. Oh, it's worse. Oh, goody. (laughs) I was worried there for a second. This is the nicest section of the story. So... That's the nice section of the story. <laughs> he would later be jailed for 15 months in 1894 for committing incest with his eldest daughter, who was aged only 13. Oh, yeah, you were right. That was the nice part of the story. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, Kirton's mother obtained a separation order and later remarried and relocated to Dusseldorf. Four years later, he befriended a local dog catcher who lived in the same building as his family and began accompanying him on his rounds. This individual would often torture and kill the animals he caught, and Kirton soon became an active and willing participant in torturing the animals himself. Behead them. Being the eldest surviving son, Kirton was the target of much of his father's physical abuse. Although he was a good scholar, he would later recollect his academic performance suffered due to the extensive physical violence he had endured from his father. He frequently refused to return home from school. From an early age, Kirton frequently ran away from home for periods of time ranging from days to weeks. Much of the time Kirton spent out on the streets was in the company of petty criminals and social misfits. Via these acquaintances, Kirton was introduced to various forms of petty crime, which he would initially commit as a means of feeding and clothing himself while living on the streets. It was his choice to live on the streets. To escape his abusive father. Look, you're going you're to find out some, some more shit about this guy, so just hold fire on criticising the living on the streets. Hey, I'm still pissed about the dog torturing. Don't worry, you'll hate him more by the end. Thank you, you're such a good friend. You said you liked morbid stuff. <laughs> Not dog killing. <laughs> Kirton later claimed to have committed his first murder at the age of nine, when he pushed a school friend whom he knew was unable to swim off a raft. When a second boy attempted to save the drowning youngster, Kirton held the boy's head underwater in order for both boys to drown. Both deaths were ruled by authorities to be accidental. Yeah, I don't care about killing people. At the age of 13, Kirton formed a relationship with a girl of his age who, although happy to allow Kirton to undress and fondle her, would resist any attempts he made to engage in intercourse. In response, Kirton resorted to acts of bestiality with the sheep, pigs and goats in the local stables to achieve satisfaction, but later claimed he obtained the greatest sense of elation when he actually stabbed these animals just prior to his achieving orgasm. Dude, masturbation exists! <laughs> yeah, but the internet didn't, so if you got some weird shit going on... If you got some weird sheep going on... 
Thus, he began stabbing and slashing at animals with increasing frequency to achieve orgasm. Although he was adamant this behaviour ended when he was observed stabbing a pig. So someone caught him doing it. Oh, great. He is also known to have attempted to rape the same sister his father had earlier molested. How, uh, did, did this sister go to therapy at some point in, his, in her life? Oh, I hope so. I hope that that woman got like reincarnated into something awesome. <laughs> something that would hopefully piss on their graves. In 1897, at the age of 14, so all this happened before he was 14. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> At the age of 14, he left school. At his father's insistence, he obtained employment as an apprentice moulder. The apprenticeship would last for two years before Curtin stole all the money he could find in his household, plus approximately 300 marks from his employer, and ran away from home. He relocated to Coblenz, where he began a brief relationship with a prostitute two years his senior, who he claimed willingly submitted to every form of sexual perversion he demanded of her. Yes, honey, it's called prostitution. That's not a relationship. Yeah, he's not paying for it. That's what he thinks. <laughs> In an era before any form of antibiotics. <laughs> True, he would be paying for it later on. He was apprehended just four weeks later and charged with both breaking and entering and theft and subsequently sentenced to one month's imprisonment. He was released from prison in August 1899 and reverted to a life of petty crime he had lived before his arrest. He lived with, like, a person who physically and mentally abused him. One month in incarceration? That would be nothing. Yeah, and whilst the actions that have already happened and the ones that are, you're going to learn about can never be sort of explained, like, not explained, but justified in any way, the fact that he did receive such extreme abuse as a child definitely, definitely played a part in... Everything Making him happen. such a nut job? Yeah. I would say that giving him one month in a mental facility would be a better punishment than giving him one month in prison, especially at that time. Yes, but this is 1899 mental health facilities. We're pretty very, much prisons very, anyway. very. You had to be really tough to survive it back then. Yeah. Way more than prison. Curden claimed to have committed his first murder as an adult in November 1899. He said that he picked up an 18-year-old girl at the Alistrad and persuaded her to accompany him to the Hofgarten, where he claimed to have engaged in sex with the girl before strangling her to death with his bare hands. No records exist to corroborate his claims. If this attack did indeed take place, the victim likely survived the assault. Nevertheless, Curtin would later state that, via his committing this act, he had proven to himself that the greatest heights of sexual ecstasy could only be achieved in this manner. Shortly thereafter, in 1900, Curtin was arrested for fraud. He would be re-arrested later the same year on the same charge, although on this second occasion, charges pertaining to his 1899 Dusselhof thefts, plus the attempted murder of a girl with a firearm, were added to the indictment. Consequently, Curtin was sentenced to four years' imprisonment in October 1900. He served this sentence in, the su in a suburb of Dusseldorf. Wait, so this was like house arrest? He wasn't even in an actual prison? Who serves time in a <laughs> suburb? Unless you're like an old grandma. <laughs> yeah, that's what Florida really is. It's prison for old people. I mean, usually I assume people choose to go live in Florida... <laughs> but we may never, I, I might be missing the, like, I maybe they were imprisoned. Maybe this is their hell. That would explain a lot about that place. Released in the summer of 1904, Curtin was drafted into the German army. He was deployed to the Alsatane city of Metz. I'm going to say this now, I apologize for any incorrect pronunciations of German words. I probably should have tried to edit as many of them out as I could, but you do have to say the odd place every now and again. He soon deserted the army. That autumn, Curtin began committing acts of arson, which he would discreetly watch as emergency services attempted to extinguish the fires. The majority of these fires were in barns and haylofts, and Curtin would estimate to police that he committed approximately 24 acts of arson upon his arrest that New Year's Eve. He also freely admitted that these fires had been committed both for his sexual excitement and in the hopes of burning sleeping tramps alive. That's not the idea of sexy. <laughs> this is not what's considered hot. 
some people would find flaming hobos erotic. I, by some people, I mean this one person, but still. I mean, I assume that some people are flaming, <laughs> but I don't think that's what the community means. <laughs> As a result of his desertion from the army, Kirkent was tried by the military system and convicted of desertion in addition to multiple counts of arson, robbery and attempted robbery. He was imprisoned from 1905 to 1913. Kirkent served his sentence in Munster, with much of his time spent in solitary confinement for repeated instances of insubordination. He's 30 at this time and he's been sentenced to prison four times. He's, he's getting a lot of miles under his belt. He had an eventful life for such a young man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not many people uh, leave home at 16, steal from multiple people, sleep with a prostitute a number of times and go to prison to get out. To sleep with all sheep over again. several times. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if interesting is the right word to describe his life, but it's definitely different from most. That is the understatement of the year. Curtin would later claim to investigators and psychologists. This period of incarceration was that in which he first encountered severe forms of discipline, and as such, the erotic fantasies he had earlier developed while incarcerated in Dusseldorf expanded to include graphic fantasies of his striking out at society and killing masses of people. These fantasies became ever more paramount and overbearing in his mind, and Kirtan would later claim that he derived a sort of pleasure from these visions that other people would get from thinking about a naked woman, adding that he would occasionally spontaneously ejaculate while preoccupied with such thoughts. I, I never really thought naked woman equals death to people, but, you know, compared to Kieran, maybe... Holy crap, I'm normal compared to someone. That's, that's a very disturbing thought. <laughs> the first murder that Kirtan is confirmed to have committed occurred on the 25th of May, 1913. During the course of a burglary at a tavern in a town in Mulheim, al Rhein, he encountered a nine-year-old girl named Christine Klein asleep in her bed. He strangled the child, then slashed her twice across the throat with a pocket knife, ejaculating as he heard the blood dripping from her wounds onto the floor by her bed. The following day, Kirtan specifically returned to Klon to drink in a tavern located directly opposite the home in which he had murdered Christine Klein, so that he could listen to the locals' reaction to the child's murder. He would later recollect to investigators he had derived an extreme sense of gratification from the general disgust and outrage that he had heard in the patrons' conversations. Moreover, in the weeks following her funeral, he would occasionally travel to the town to visit the child's grave, adding that when he handled the soil covering her grave, he would spontaneously ejaculate. Sounds more like he has an ejaculation problem. <laughs> yeah, I should probably get that look. Than, than odd sexual desires. Two months later, again in the course of committing a burglary with the aid of a skeleton key, Curtin broke into another home. Discovering a 17-year-old girl named Gertrude Franken, Curtin manually strangled the girl, ejaculating at the sight of the blood spouting from her mouth. Curtin managed to escape from the scene of both this murder and that of the Klein murder undetected. Strangled her manually? What was the other option here? Um, the dude was insane. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's no no denying that. Just days after the murder of Gertrude Franken on the 14th of July, Curtin was arrested for a series of arson attacks and burglaries. He was sentenced to six years imprisonment, although his repeated instances of insubordination while imprisoned saw his incarceration extended by a further two years. Curtin served his sentence in a military prison in the town of Brieg. So that's prison again. Yes, because he hasn't experienced that enough, and <laughs> as you can see, it totally helps. It's the fact that he got arrested for the arson. It's like, just stop setting fire to things. And you stop killing people as well. But, you know, if you're getting caught for the setting fire to stuff, stop setting fire to stuff. Released in April 1921, Curtin relocated to Altenburg, where he initially lived with his sister. Through his sister, Curtin became acquainted with a woman three years his senior named August Schlaff, a sweet shop proprietor and former prostitute who had previously been convicted of shooting her fiancé to death and whom Curtin initially posed as a former prisoner of war. Two years later, Curtin and August married, and although the couple regularly engaged in sex, Curtin later admitted he could consummate his marriage only by fantasising about committing violence against other individuals, and that after their wedding night, he engaged in intercourse with his wife only at her invitation. 
For the first time in his life, Kirton obtained regular employment, also becoming an active trades union official, although with the exception of his wife, he formed no close friendships. In 1925, he returned with his wife to Dusseldorf, where he soon began affairs with a serving girl named Tidy and a housemaid. When his wife discovered his infidelities, Tidy reported Kirton to police, claiming he had seduced her thus earning him an eight-month prison sentence for seduction and threatening behaviour. This is prison sentence number six, for anyone keeping count. Kirton served six months of his sentence, with his early release being upon the condition he relocated to Dusseldorf. I think every time there is a prison sentence, someone should drink, but then I'm scared that someone will die of alcohol poisoning by the end of the show. <laughs> It is just like an ad break at this point. It's like, oh, yeah, prison again. It, it breaks up the story at nice intervals. On the 3rd of February, 1929, Curtin stalked an elderly woman named Apollonia. Because he could be creepy enough before. Waiting until she was shielded from the view of potential witnesses by bushes, Curtin pounced upon her, grabbing her by the lapels of her coat and shouting the words, No row, don't scream, before dragging her into nearby undergrowth, where he proceeded to stab her 24 times with a sharpened pair of scissors. Although many of the wounds he inflicted were so deep they impacted her bones, she survived her injuries. On the 8th of February, he strangled a nine-year-old girl named Rosa into unconsciousness, before stabbing her in the stomach, temples, genitals, and heart with a pair of scissors, spontaneously ejaculating as he knifed the child. He then in inserted his semen into her vagina using his fingers. He made a rudimentary effort to hide the girl's body by dragging it beneath a hedge, before returning to the scene with a bottle of kerosene several hours later and setting the child's body alight. He achieved an orgasm at the sight of the flames. Her body was found beneath the hedge the following day. On the 13th of February, he murdered a 45-year-old mechanic named Rudolf Scheer in the suburb of Flingenord. He stabbed him 20 times, particularly about the head, back and eyes. Following the discovery of the body, Curtin returned to the scene of the murder to converse with police, falsely informing one detective that he had heard about the murder via the telephone. Yes, officer. I was totally not at fault here. It was my neighbour. See, I always thought that whole thing in crime dramas where they say the murderer always comes back to the scene of the crime was a bit of a cliche something that they use just to track people down in fiction but but no this this guy is just going back and is always well there. it's it's kind of like watching for a trophy mm. people want to see their handiwork yeah, and I guess in a day where you don't have internet and, and people would be tweeting and posting pictures and making posts on social media about these kind of crimes, back in the day you, you would probably, yeah, you'd have to go back to the scene of the crime or wait a couple of days for it to hit the papers. Despite the difference in age and sex of the three victims, the fact that all three crimes had been committed in the same district of Dusseldorf at dusk, that each victim had received a multitude of stab wounds likely inf inflicted in rapid succession and invariably involving at least one wound to the temple, plus the absence of common motives such as robbery, led investigators to conclude the same perpetrator had committed all three attacks. Furthermore, the seemingly random selection of these victims led criminologists to remark as to the abnormal nature of the perpetrator. Although Kirton did attempt to strangle four women between March and July of 1929, one of whom he claimed to have thrown into the river, he is not known to have killed any further victims until the 11th of August, where he raped, strangled, then repeatedly stabbed a young woman named Maria Hahn. Kirton had first encountered Hahn on the 8th of August, and he arranged to take her on a date the following Sunday. After several hours in Hahn's company, Kirton lured her into a meadow in order so that he could kill her. This is like Ted Bundy, apparently, in his sexual prowess. Because this dude doesn't even want to have actual sex with women. They don't turn him on, apparently. As much as blood and gore and all those sexy, sexy things. His objective here is not an actual objective, apparently. he He's just proving at this point that he can. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know, the, the randomness of the victims, especially before when it was saying that the, the, the previous three victims had absolutely nothing in common. To me, it just strikes as he's walking by, sees his chance and thinks, yeah, I'm going to do this just because I can. I'm, I'm more confused about his success. 
Yeah, it's amazing he's managed to get away with as much as he has already. Not only managed to get away with it, it's also his ability to get women to to keep to keep lore women in. It's just some dark magic. Yeah. I was gonna say perhaps he was a handsome man, but I've seen pictures of him and he's not at all, really. But also even even if you're a handsome man, someone has sort of darkness around them, people can sort of feel it. Yeah. Like they- like, like people follow their gut feeling a lot of time and and give them a bad vibe and holy crap he looks like a fat hitler <laughs> <laughs> yes with the yes. tiny mustache yeah i i've just sent addy the picture of of kid and fat hitler definitely comes close to describing his look this is like if charlie chaplin dressed up as actual hitler and charlie chaplin was actually a handsome man <laughs> Yeah, I, I look at this picture and think this is what Hitler would look like if he became a painter. Yeah, yeah. This is the loser artist version of Hitler because that picture on the right, he just looks so sad. <laughs> it's like his chin is resting on his lapel. It's like, uh, okay, is that my look? <laughs> That's the look someone has when they think, oh, what have I done with my life? He's done with others' life. That's for sure. And the listeners will know the pictures we're talking about because the, these will be in the in the episode image. So if you're curious, just have a quick look on whatever device you're Oh, and, and send, a, a, send us your thoughts about these gorgeous portraits of this man. <laughs> I can't say it with a straight face. Uh, he probably had some odd charm about him that made women so attracted to him but i i think if i saw this guy on the street i'd just feel like i should run <laughs> that would probably but to be, be fair best. that's that's a sensation most people give me <laughs> in this case it would be justified Curtin later admitted that Han had repeatedly pleaded with him to spare her life as he alternatively strangled her, stabbed her in the chest and head, and sat astride her body, waiting for her to die. Han died approximately one hour after the attack began, so he spent an hour killing that poor woman. What a shitty end of an hour of your life. Yeah. Well, I suppose the end would have been... Like, if it was a quick job, then... Okay. Yeah, if, if someone's going to murder but, me, I'd rather it not take an hour. Yeah, like, okay, five minutes, and that would be too much. But an hour of constant attacks just to die? That's just cruel. Fearful that his wife may connect the bloodstains she had noticed on his clothes with Han's murder, Curtin later buried the body in a cornfield, only to return to her body several weeks later, with the intention of nailing her decomposing remains to a tree in a mock crucifixion to shock and disgust the public. However, her remains proved too heavy for Kierden to complete this act, and he simply returned her corpse to her grave, before embracing and caressing the decomposing body as he lay beneath her. Oh yeah, now I understand why he's so attracted to this. Sounds so sexy. He then reburied her body. According to Curtin's later confession, both before and after he had attempted to impale Han's corpse to a tree, he and this is a quote here, went to the grave many times and kept improving on it, and every time I thought of what was lying there and was filled with satisfaction. Three months after Kierten had murdered Maria Han, he posted an anonymous letter to the police in which he confessed to the murder, adding that her remains had been buried in a field. In this letter, Kierten also drew a crude map describing the location of her remains. The letter would prove sufficiently detailed to enable investigators to locate her remains on the 15th of November. Following the murder of Maria Hahn, Kierten changed his choice of weapons from scissors to a knife, in an apparent effort to convince police that more than one perpetrator was responsible for this spate of assaults and murders. In the early morning of the 21st of August, Kierten randomly stabbed an 18-year-old girl, a 30-year-old woman, and a 37-year-old woman in separate attacks. Oh, that that sounds like a very well-used day. Yeah, he's he's ticking them off. Yep, that's that sounds like a productive afternoon. What did you do today, honey? Well, I killed three different women. <laughs> oh, uh, can you no, pass no. me the butter? All three women were seriously wounded, but they survived the attacks. 
Three days later, at a fairground, he observed two foster sisters, aged five and fourteen, walking from the fairground through adjoining allotments en route to their home. Sending the older girl, Louise Lenzen, on an errand to purchase cigarettes for him upon the promise of being given money in return for the favour, Kierten lifted the younger child, Gertrude Hamisher, off the ground by her neck and strangled her into unconsciousness before cutting her throat and discarding her body in a patch of runner beans. He literally lifted a child and strangled her to death. No, no. He strangled her unconscious, then he slashed her throat. Oh, that's better. Sorry. <laughs> How could I make such a serious mistake? He does a lot of strangling. You that's know, to be fair, better. He does a lot of strangling. Oh, so that's how you become a supervillain. When her foster sister returned to the scene, Kierton strangled her before stabbing her around the torso with one wound piercing her aorta. He also bit and twice cut her throat before sucking blood from the wounds. Dude, you're not a moiho. Leave that alone. Neither girl had been sexually assaulted. Aww. The following day, Kierton accosted a 27-year-old housemaid named Gertrude, whom he openly asked to engage in sex with him. Upon being rebuffed, Kierton shouted, Well, die then! before repeatedly stabbing the woman in the head, neck, shoulders, and back. Gertrude survived her injuries, although she was unable to provide investigators with a clear description of her assailant, beyond assuming his age to be around 40. Curtin attempted to murder two further victims, one by strangulation, another by stabbing, in September, before opting to predominantly use a hammer in his murders instead. Oh, okay, that's, that sounds like the best tool. On the evening of the 30th of September, Curtin encountered a 31-year-old serving girl named Ida Rauter at Dusseldorf Station. He successfully persuaded Rauter to accompany him to a cafe, then for a walk through the local Hofton Garden, close to the Rhine River. At this location, he repeatedly struck her about the head with a hammer before and after he raped her. At one stage in the assault, Rauter regained consciousness and began pleading with Curtin to spare her life. In response, Curtin simply, and this is a quote from him, gave her another hammer blow to the head and misused her. Eleven days later, on the 11th of October, he encountered a 22-year-old servant girl named Elizabeth Doria outside of a theatre. As had been the case with Rauter, Doria agreed to accompany Curtin for a drink at a cafe before the pair took a train to Grafenberg with the view to walk alongside the Klein Dussel River. What is with him in rivers? <laughs> look, you, you, you want to do your killing somewhere nice to look at. Of course, but I thought that the blood for him is the something nice to look at. He can also appreciate a nice river, Addy. I mean, I assume that a river is just an easier place to dump bodies. Yes, that too. She was struck once across her right temple with a hammer, then raped. Kierton struck her repeatedly about the head and both temples with his hammer and left her for dead. Dorier was found at, found at 6.30am the following morning, although she would die from her injuries the following day, without awakening from her coma in which she was discovered. On the 25th of October, Kierton attacked two women with a hammer, both survived, although in the second instance, this was only because Kierton's hammer broke in the attack. So, apparently he's not a very good craftsman. Or he's just beating people that much that he's breaking hammers, which is a terrifying thought. Yes, but how shit can you be with hitting someone with a hammer that you don't manage to kill them? It's the 1920s, the crappy hammers. Or crappy people not knowing where to hit someone on the head? It's literally the head. One good hit and someone can die. Let's, do let's... not, do not kill people. If you listen to this podcast, do not take my advice. Yeah, I was going to say, let's let's not wish that this guy had a higher body count. He's doing enough damage as is. Yes, I am not in. I'm not in in any way saying this guy should be better at doing this. I am simply commenting at his terrible work. On the seventh of November, Kierton encountered a five year old girl named Gertrude Alberman. He persuaded the child to accompany him to a section of deserted allotments, where he seized her by the throat and strangled her. He stabbed her once in the left temple with a pair of scissors as he did so. Kitten stabbed the child further 34 times in the temple and chest before leaving the body in a pile of nettles against a factory wall. By the late summer of 1929, the murders committed by the individual the press had dubbed the Vampire of Dusseldorf were receiving considerable oh. national and international attention. So he's the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Ah, you've heard of him. Yeah, but I never associated him with the 
poor fat Hitler craftsman. <laughs> So this is why I don't tell you the titles. So you have that moment of, ah, I know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I've heard about the vampire of Dusseldorf. Due to the sheer savagery of the murders, the diverse background of the victims, and the differing methods in which they had been assaulted and or murdered, both the police and the press theorised the spate of assaults and murders were the work of more than one perpetrator. I mean, wasn't that the whole point of using, like, the hammer and the... Yeah. Uh knife and the scissors and all that so people would assume there's more than one murderer mm -hmm. which again not that we're condoning anything he's done but not that bad of an idea Get i'm pretty sure that's the people. only good idea he had in this whole concept <laughs> <laughs> by the end of 1929 Dusseldorf police have received more than 13,000 letters from the public with assistance from surrounding police forces each lead was painstakingly pursued as a result of this collected investigation into the killings, more than 9,000 individuals will be interviewed. Other clues painstakingly pursued and a list of 900,000 different names will be compiled on an official potential suspects list. Two days after the murder of Gertrude Alberman, a local communist newspaper received a map revealing the location of the grave of Maria Hamm. In this drawing, Curtin also revealed precisely where he had left Alberman's body, which had been found earlier that day. Describing the exact position of the corpse, which he stated could be found face down amongst bricks and rubble. An analysis of the handwriting revealed that the author was the same individual who had anonymously informed police in a letter dated the 14th of October that he had killed Han and buried her body at the edge of a woods. Each letter Curtin had thus far sent to newspapers and police describing his exploits and threatening further assaults and murders was examined by a graphologist, who confirmed that the same individual had written each letter thus leading the chief inspector of the Berlin police to conclude that one man was responsible for most or all of the murders and assaults. The murder of Gertrude Alderman would prove to be Curtin's final fatal attack, although he did engage in a spate of non-fatal hammer attacks and attempted strangulations between February and May 1930, maiming ten victims in these assaults. All recipients survived and many were able to describe their attack to police. On the 14th of May 1930, an unknown man approached a 20-year-old woman named Maria Budlick at Dusseldorf Station. Discovering Budlick had travelled to Dusseldorf from Köln in search of lodgings and employment, this individual offered to direct her towards a local hostel. She agreed to follow this individual, although she became apprehensive when this man attempted to lead her through a scarcely populated park. The pair began to argue, whereupon another man approached them, asking whether she was being pestered by her companion. When she nodded, the individual with whom she was arguing walked away. The man who came to her rescue was Peter Kierton. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I thought someone finally had common sense about this creep. But no, he's the fucking savior. <laughs> now he's saving victims from other people. <laughs> Kierton invited the distressed young woman to his apartment to eat and drink. Do not! <laughs> Once there, she deduced the underlying motive for his hospitality and stated that she was uninterested in engaging with sec in sex with him. Curtin calmly agreed and offered to take her to a hotel, although instead he lured her to a woods where he seized her by the throat and attempted to strangle her as he raped her. When she began to scream, Curtin released his grasp on her throat, allowing her to escape. Good woman. Budlick did not report the assault to police. Bad woman. <laughs> Instead, she described her ordeal in a letter to a friend, although she addressed the letter incorrectly. As such, the letter was opened at the post office by a clerk on the 19th of May. Upon reading the contents of the letter, this clerk forwarded the letter to Dusseldorf Police. It was read by the chief inspector, who deduced that there was a slim chance that Budlick's assailant might be the Dusseldorf murderer. The chief inspector interviewed Budlick, who encountered her ordeal, further divulging one of the reasons Kitten had spared her was because she had falsely informed him that she could not remember his address. She agreed to lead the police to Kierden's home. When the landlady of the property let Budlick into the house, Budlick confirmed to the chief inspector that this was the address of her assailant. The landlady confirmed to the chief inspector that the tenant's name was Peter Curtin. Although Kierden was not at home when Budlick and the chief inspector searched his property, he spotted the pair in a communal hallway and promptly left the property. Knowing that his identity was now known to the police, and suspecting that they may also have connected him to the crimes committed by the vampire of Dusseldorf, Curtin confessed to his wife that he had raped Budlick, and that because of his previous convictions, he may receive 15 years penal labour. 
With his wife's consent, he found lodgings elsewhere and did not return to his own home until the 23rd of May. You know, it's terrible, though, that people at that point listen to rape victims better than people listen today to rape victims. Yeah. A woman came to the police station after she sent a letter to a friend and was like, yeah, I was raped, and the police believe her. At a time when people didn't have the forensic kits, crime fighting is amazing. Upon returning home, Kirten confessed to his wife he was the vampire of Dusseldorf. He urged his wife to collect the substantial reward offered for his capture. August Curtin contacted the police the following day. In the information provided to the detectives, Curtin's wife explained that although she had known her husband had been repeatedly imprisoned in the past, she was unaware of his culpability in any murders. She then added that her husband had confessed to her his crimes as the vampire of Dusseldorf and that he was willing to likewise confess to police. Furthermore, he was to meet her outside St. Roch's Church later that day. That afternoon, Curtin was arrested at gunpoint. Curtin freely admitted to his guilt in all the crimes police had attributed to the vampire of Dusseldorf, and further confessed he had committed the unsolved murders of Christine Klein and Gertrude Franken in 1913. In total, Curtin admitted to 68 crimes, including 10 murders and 31 attempted murders. Holy crap, he's a worse murderer than we expected. He made no attempt to excuse his crimes. How shit do you have to be to fail in 31 attempted murders? Again, we're not wishing he had more murders. No, we, <laughs> we are very much against murdering people. Although Addy does seem more outraged by his inability to murder than the fact that he is murdering. Yes, that's... <laughs> come on, you, like, the, how shit do you have to be? I understand, like, the two with the hammer, because it broke, which is a flimsy excuse, and you can get pills for that now. But 31. I think a lot of it came down to he assumed these people were dead and just left them. Maybe which... that's why doctors are better murderers. The hammer wouldn't break in the hand of a doctor. He made no attempt to excuse his crimes, but justified them upon the basis of what he saw as the injustices he had endured throughout his life. Nevertheless, he was ha adamant he had not tortured any of his child victims. Kitten Great. Also, at silver lining, yeah. <laughs> oh, good for you. You murdered children, but at least they didn't suffer much. Kitten also admitted to both investigators and psychiatrists that the actual sight of his victim's blood was, on many occasions, sufficient to bring him to orgasm, and that on occasion, if he experienced ejaculation in the act of strangling a woman, he would immediately become apologetic to his victim, proclaiming, that's what love is all about. Murdering innocent women, that, that is the definition of love. And may also explain why there were 31 attempted murders. If he came before he killed them, you know, maybe he got a bit sleepy. Maybe he lit a cigarette and rolled over and they survived. Why be? Kirtan further claimed to have drunk the blood from the throats of one victim, from the temple of another, and to have licked the blood from a third victim's hand. In one of these instances, he had drunk so much blood from the neck wound he had inflicted upon the victim that he vomited. Yes, that's what happens when people who should not digest blood, digest blood. Kirtan also admitted to having decapitated a swan in the year. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh at this one, but after all the people killing, this just seems so bizarre. He admitted to decapitating a swan in the spring of 1930 so that he could drink the blood from the animal's neck, achieving ejaculation in the process. Um, one of these things should not be swallowed and the other is optional. On the 13th of April 1931, Peter Kirton stood trial in Dusseldorf. He was charged with nine counts of murder and seven of attempted murder, and was tried before presiding judge Dr. Rose. Kirton pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to each of the charges. Aside from when delivering testimony, Kirton would spend the duration of his trial surrounded by a heavily guarded, shoulder-high iron cage, specifically constructed to protect him from attacks by the enraged relatives of his victims, and his feet would be shackled whenever he was inside the cage. I, 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 I have no words. Proceedings began with the prosecution formally reciting each of the charges against Kirton, before they recited the formal confession he had provided to police following his arrest. When then asked by the presiding judge to describe why he had continued to commit acts of arson throughout 1929 and 1930, Kirton elaborated, 
With my desire for injuring people awoke, the love of setting fire to things awoke as well. The sight of the flames excited me, but above all, it was the excitement of the attempts to extinguish the fires and the agitation of those who saw their property being destroyed. Having claimed that his initial confession had been delivered to simply allow his wife to recoup the reward money offered for the Dusseldorf vampire capture several days into his trial, Curtin instructed that his defence attorney that he wished to change his plea to one of guilty. Addressing the court, Curtin proclaimed, I have no remorse. As to whether recollections of my deed makes me feel ashamed, I will tell you that, thinking back on all the details, it is not that unpleasant. I rather enjoyed it. Further pressed as to whether he considered himself to possess a conscience, Curtin stated that he did not. Nevertheless, when pressed as to his motivation for confessing, Curtin reiterated, Why don't you understand that I am fond of my wife, and that I am still fond of her? I have done many wrongs. I have been unfaithful over and over again. My wife has never done anything wrong. Even when she heard of the many prison sentences I served, she said, I won't let you down, otherwise you will be lost altogether. I wanted to fix it for my wife, a carefree old age. To counteract Curtin's insanity defence, the prosecution introduced five of the most eminent doctors and psychiatrists in Germany to testify at the trial. Each testified that Curtin was legally sane, and had been perfectly in control of his actions and impulses at the time. Typical of the testimony delivered by these experts was that of Professor Franz Scioli, who testified as to Curtin's actual motivations in his crying, being that a desire to achieve sexual gratification he demanded, and that this, satisfa and that this satisfaction could only be achieved by acts of brutality, violence, and Curtin's knowledge of the pain and misery his actions would cause to others. Dr. Karl Berg would testify that Curtin's motive in committing murders and attempting murder was 90% sadism and 10% revenge relating to his perceived sense of injustice for both the neglect and abuse he had endured as a child and the discipline he had endured while incarcerated. Moreover, Dr. Berg stated that despite Curtin's admission to having embraced and digitally penetrated the corpses of Maria Hahn and to have spontaneously ejaculated while holding the soil covering the coffin of Christina Klein, his conclusion was that Curtin was not a necrophiliac. That's their take from this. That's the good part. I suppose at this point they're looking for any shred of a good part. I was fond of my wife and I don't think dead corpses are arousing. Yay! Further proof of Curtin's awareness was referenced by the premeditated nature of his crimes, his ability to abandon attack if he sensed a risk of being disturbed, and his acute memory of both his crimes and their chronological detail. Disclosed in the first week of the trial were the deaths of two boys whom Curtin had confessed to drowning at the age of nine, with the prosecution suggesting that these deaths indicated Curtin had displayed homicidal propensity dating back much earlier than 1913. Didn't he, like, murder dogs and cats that he captured? That's literally the indication that he's a psychopath. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's, like, all ten categories. This view was disputed by medical witnesses who suggested that although indicative of an inherent depravity, these two deaths should not be compared to Curtin's later murders. As to a child, the death of a friend can be seen as nothing more than an inconsequential passing. Ah, yes. That, that is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Bullshit. Upon cross-examination, Curtin's defence attorney, Dr. Alex Werner, did challenge these experts' conclusions, arguing that the sheer range of perversion his clients had engaged in was tantamount to insanity, although each doctor and psychiatrist remained adamant that Curtin was legally sane and responsible for his actions. In a further attempt to discredit the validity of many of the charges recited at the opening stages of the trial, Werner also questioned whether the occasional inaccuracies of the crimes described in his client's confession equated to Curtin having fabricated at least some of the crimes. Thus supporting his contention, Curtin possessed a diseased mind. In response, one of these experts, Dr. Karl Berg, conceded that the sections of Curtin's confessions were false, but argued that the knowledge he had possessed of the murder scenes and the wounds inflicted upon the victims left him in no doubt as to his guilt, and that the minor embellishments in his confessions could be attributed to Curtin's narcissistic personality. The trial lasted ten days. On the 22nd of April, the jury retired to consider their verdict. They would deliberate for less than two hours before reaching their verdict. Kirton was found guilty and sentenced to death on nine counts of murder. He was also found guilty of seven counts of attempted murder. Kirton displayed no emotion as the sentence was passed. Although his final address to the court, he did state that he now saw his crimes as being so ghastly that he did not want to make any sort of excuse for them. 
Curtin did not lodge an appeal against his conviction, although he did submit a petition for a pardon to the Minister of Justice, who was known to be an opponent of capital punishment. This petition was formally rejected. I wonder fucking why. Curtin remained composed upon receipt of this news and asked for permission to see his confessor, to write letters of apology to the relatives of his victims and a final farewell letter to his wife. All of the requests were granted. Uh, to be fair, I, I just have to say that if this person ever hurt me or m someone from my family, I would not want to receive any letter from this creep. Yeah. And to get something to attempt to apologize, I would be furious and I would ask if I can be in the shooting squad. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can understand them allowing him to write to his wife, but to write letters to the families of his victims... I feel like it it's hurting... Belief. I feel like it's gonna hurt the family of the victims. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no way it can't. That's, that's kind of like building so much salt on your wound. It's like drying an ocean and rolling you in it covered with tiny cuts. As Curtin waited his trial, then later, when he awaited his execution, he was extensively interviewed by Dr. Carl Berg. In these interviews, Curtin stated to Dr. Berg that his primary motive in committing any form of criminal activity was one of sexual pleasure, and that he had begun to associate sexual excitement with violent acts and the sight of blood via indulging in both daydreams and masturbation fantasies, particularly when he had been isolated from human contact. The majority of his assaults and murder has been committed while his wife had been working evenings, and as the number of Stabs or bludgeoning wounds Curtin inflicted upon each victim had varied depending on the length of time it had taken him to achieve orgasm. Furthermore, the actual sight of his victim's blood had been integral to his sexual stimulation. Curtin further elaborated to Dr. Berg that once he had committed an attack or murder, the feeling of tension he experienced prior to the commission of a crime would be superseded by one of relief. In reference to the actual choice of weapons used in his attacks, Curtin stressed that although he had changed his actual method of attack to deceive investigators into believing that they were seeking more than one perpetrator, the weapon he used was inconsequential in reference to his ultimate objective of seeing his victim's blood. Elaborating, Curtin stated, whether I took a knife or a pair of scissors or a hammer in order to see blood was a matter of indifference to me or mere chance. Often after the hammer blows, the bleeding victims moved and struggled, just as they did when they were throttled. Curtin further confided that although he had occasionally penetrated his female victims, he had only done so to feign the acts of coitus as a motive for his crimes. He also confessed that many of his later strangulation victims had only survived his attacks because he had achieved orgasm in those early throes of the assault. Oh, great. However... Curtin would contradict these claims by proclaiming to both Dr. Berg and legal examiners that his primary motive in all of his criminal activities was both to strike back at an oppressive society for what he considered the injustice of him being repeatedly incarcerated throughout his life and as a form of revenge for the neglect and abuse he endured as a child. These desires had fermented in his mind throughout the long periods he had been confined in solitary confinement for various forms of insubordination, and Curtin explained that he would deliberately break minor prison rules as a means of guaranteeing that he would be sentenced to solitary confinement in order that he could indulge in these psychosexual fantasies. Or, you know, just cut off his balls. Probably would have solved a lot of problems. I know, saved so many lives. It's one of the times where cutting someone's balls could literally save other people's lives. <laughs> yeah. To Dr. Berg and the legal examiners, Curtin did not deny that he had sexually molested his female victims, or to have stroked or digitally penetrated their genitals as he stabbed, slashed, strangled, or bludgeoned their bodies. Although throughout his trial, Curtin consistently claimed that sexual assault as a victim was not the primary motive. At 6 o'clock on the morning of the 2nd of July, Peter Curtin was beheaded by guillotine in the grounds of the prison. He walked unassisted to the guillotine, flanked by the prison psychiatrist and a priest. Shortly before his head was placed on the guillotine, Curtin turned to the psychiatrist and asked the question, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be a pleasure to end all pleasures. No, dude, no, that's not gonna happen. When asked whether he had any last words to say, Curtin simply smiled and replied, no. 
Following Curtin's execution, his head was dissected and mummified. The brain was removed and subjected to forensic analysis in an attempt to explain his personality and behaviour. The examinations of the brain revealed no abnormalities. The autopsy conducted on Curtin's body revealed that aside from having an enlarged thalamus gland, Curtin did not suffer physical abnormalities. The interviews Curtin granted to Dr. Kahlberg in 1930 and 1931 would prove to be the first psychological study conducted upon a sexual serial killer. These interviews would also form the basis of Berg's book, The Sadist. Shortly after the Second World War, Curtin's head was transported to the United States, where it is still currently on display in Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Wisconsin Dells. And that's the story of the Vampire of Dusseldorf. You look very shocked, Daddy. You said you liked morbid things. How, was was that morbid enough for you? Oh, this was deliciously morbid. <laughs> you you look more shocked and depressed than I think I've ever seen you look. And we've talked about some shocking and depressing things in the past. I have no issue with acts of, of violence and murder. To those who listen, I do not commit them. It's more like hearing about it or seeing it. It's It's not very hard for me because of my previous experiences with gory issues but the hurting children and sexual assault and the fact that he he achieved so much satisfaction from it that's the part that i have issues with he just randomly took children and killed them for his own pleasure Mm -hmm. all murder is horrific but somehow, if this was premeditated murder against someone who had wronged him or someone he was jealous of or something like that, it would f- sit so much easier in him just randomly picking anyone. An adult. Just going, uh, if it's children, th- these are like creatures who had no chance of wronging anyone. I mean, of- obviously some kids are brats, but I'm not going to kill them for it. Just how how do you manage to excuse yourself? At least he didn't try in his trial. He didn't justify it in any way other than he enjoyed it. There was no deeper meaning he tried to get f- from it. Yeah, but but okay, let's let's talk about like uh Jamestown. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about drinking the Kool Aid. There were children there that were part of the suicide, massive suicide thing. But there was what they thought was that there was meaning behind the death it's not an excuse but it somehow makes it more wholesome palatable like you can understand it in a way like all unnecessary death is bad whether it's it's murder or war or famine or everything that isn't to end suffering or due to long life that was well lived Every non-natural death is harsh and hard. My problem is that he just had nothing, just felt nothing. Not only did he feel nothing, apparently it made him feel good. And that's my main, main issue. He just felt good. Well, I promise you next time I'll have something a bit nicer for you. So, thank you for for joining me for that first episode. It was um, interesting. I really hope that despite the topic, my comments may have eased some people through it, because this is a very hard-to-swallow story. Well, I can assure the listeners that the next episode is a lot more fun. So, it's not going to be death and murderers every week. Only when a D is here. Yeah. I don't think you can promise that. (laughs) There are way too many murderers in history. (laughs) So if people enjoyed listening to you, where can they catch you um, on other podcasts? I believe you quite often appear on on some podcasts. Um, I kind of pop up often on Smorgasbord podcast. Smorgasbord is a great, fun, different, weird podcast. If you haven't heard it before you should go check it out Addie and I were both on the Christmas special recently so that would be a good place to check it out if you enjoyed what you heard here but fancied something involving less murderers less but not zero well I can't promise zero you, you never know never no yeah. well thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to our first episode if you enjoyed it please feel free to subscribe so that you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes you can also follow us on Twitter by going to at eccentric underscore earth 
And if you have any suggestions for subjects you'd like to see us cover or just want to get in contact, our email address is eccentricearth at outlook.com. Once again, thank you for listening and thank you, Eddie, for joining me. I had a very odd sadistic pleasure. Goodbye, everybody.